I'm very glad to introduce to you uh, the Right Reverend Lord Bishop, Dr. Professor Tom. <laughs> Let me just tell you one very quick story. When I was studying for ordination, it was a day in which I was going through a bit of a vocational crisis. I went and knocked on Tom's door, and uh, after about three sentences, he put down his pen, and he said, we're going for a walk. And we spent the entire afternoon. I wasted his entire afternoon. He could have written a book. <laughs> I wasted his whole afternoon walking on the mountain in Montreal, uh, thinking and praying through this issue with my teacher. Which is to say, he is not simply uh, a scholar whose, whose books one reads and who uh, disputes about whom you may find on the internet. Uh, nor is he simply a bishop, uh, or uh, by which very often is heard an administrator with no backbone. But, but rather, he is one who loves the Lord Jesus so much that he's willing to spend time with the student to help them pray through an issue. He is a pastor. And as a scholar pastor, I think he has been a pastor to many of you, even if you have not met him. So for one, uh, one more time, I want to welcome Tom Wright. Thank, thank you, Grant. I, I confess I had forgotten that story entirely, but uh, Grant, Grant, Grant was a good student. He's worth spending time with. I mean, you know what it is. Um, and thank you to the musicians. That, that uh, Teze was lovely. And then that Magnificat, I've never sung that before, but I hope I will sing it again many times in that, in that form. It's great power. Uh, when I think of being a bishop and studying and teaching Paul, I am reminded of the bishop who said plaintively, everywhere St. Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere I go, they serve tea. And, <clears throat> and it, it is a good question as to why Paul does not, well, actually, sometimes Paul does provoke riots, but not always for the right reasons today. And uh, I think Paul's gospel actually is so spectacular, so amazingly iconoclastic, so amazingly God-exalting, that we ought to expect extraordinary things to happen. What sort of extraordinary? Th well, extraordinary things like that little story whose vignette Grant read. I didn't actually suggest he read Philemon, but I had it in my notes already, and he didn't know that, that I was going to begin with Philemon, because that is actually where I began. Uh, I did some autobiography last night. I'm only just going to do one little bit tonight. On June the 2nd, 1953, before most of you were born by some way, I was aged four and a half. It was the day the Queen of England was crowned, and my parents gave my sister and me our first Bibles, and they were small King James Bibles with a coronation stamp on the front, and I guess lots and lots of people got coronation Bibles. And my sister, being a year older than me, uh, she could read reasonably well. I, I had just learned to read, and we were given this great fat book, and I remember we went through um, to, to a back room, and I remember sitting on the floor and leafing through this great fat book and being appalled at the size and scale of it, and then we came upon one little book within it which we thought we could just about manage. And on June the 2nd, 1953, uh, was my first time reading a book of the Bible straight through, and it was, of course, the letter to Philemon. I've never forgotten that moment. And Philemon is a great place to start. Few Pauline theologies, I think, begin with Philemon. I'm trying to do that in the book I'm trying to write at the moment. But perhaps we should. Because the book, the little letter we, we know as, as Philemon, gives us this bird's eye view of something which is absolutely foundational, fundamental. We've talked about it already this week, and it is just extraordinary. The slave and the master, who in anybody else's worldview in the first century would have been pulled apart by the social forces that decreed that masters and slaves evermore shall be so unless the slave buys himself out or whatever. 
and Paul brokers the deal, he hopes the vulnerable deal whereby Onesimus has to go back to the place from which he's run away, not unlike the prodigal son going back to face his father. He doesn't go back with his head held high with a letter in his pocket saying, Paul says, you've got to set me free, ha, ha, ha. I think it's not a bit like that. I think he knows this is a very serious moment. And Paul is determined to let Philemon know it's a very serious moment as well. And the way Paul does that letter, as you heard, is just magnificent as a piece of practical theology. Because Paul stretches out one hand and embraces Onesimus. Here he is, he's my child, I've begotten him in my, sl- in, in my own imprisonment. He's my very heart, I'd much rather keep him with me. And then he stretches out the other hand and says, Philemon, you are my partner, my uh, sunkoinonos, my, my, my fellow worker. By the way, and you owe me everything too. <laughs> and then, standing there like this, he says, if he has got anything, if you've got anything against him, if he owes you anything, put it down on my account. You see what's going on. Paul does not mention the crucifixion of Jesus in the letter, but it is the cross of Jesus Christ exemplified in and embodied in Paul's ministry, which is bringing unthinkably the master and the slave together. Paul is doing close up, sharp and personal what he says in the famous verse in Galatians 3, there is in Christ neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, no male and female. And this is one bit of what that actually means in practice. The cross is the place where the unreconciled can be reconciled, where in cultural terms the irreconcilable can be and are reconciled. And if you start there, you have to ask the question as a historian, what on earth is going on? Nobody else ever thought in the ancient world you could behave like that. Nobody ever thought you could do that sort of thing. And there are hints throughout the letter that the answer to that question is, There is a special, different God at work, not like the gods who dominated the pagan horizon, not not like the gods of the empire who believed in keeping the social structures exactly as they were and the slaves had to stay slaves and if they weren't careful, they would get crucified. Rather, this is the God who sets slaves free. This is the God of the Exodus. This is the God who says, I have heard the cry of my people and I've come to do what I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to set them free, and he does it by the cross. If you want the theology behind Philemon, read 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21, climaxing in that wonderful statement, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become, embody the covenant faithfulness of God. You see Paul doing that in Philemon. So the question presses, what is this new worldview? How do we describe the worldview of Paul the Apostle? It clearly isn't the worldview of Second Temple Judaism, and yet in another way it clearly is. Among recent studies of Paul, my friend and colleague in Durham, John Barclay, wrote a book on Jews in the Mediterranean world, and the final chapter was a bit of a puzzle about Paul, because he says from one point of view, Paul looks like a very liberal Jew. He sits light to circumcision, to the Sabbath, to the food laws. From another point of view, Paul looks like a very conservative Jew. His holiness code seems much stricter than that of many Jews of his day, and so on. And Barclay is setting this up, I think, as a tease. He hasn't written the subsequent volume, which he's promised yet, to show how he would reconcile those. But I think it is clear that because of Jesus the Messiah, the worldview has shifted dramatically. From one point of view, the story has been fulfilled. From another point of view, the symbols have been relativized. It is the same story, the story of how the one God is fulfilling his promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and doing so for the benefit of the whole world. That's where the story was going. But precisely because it is now for the benefit of the whole world, it cannot be defined in terms of the ethnic symbols of Second Temple Judaism. This is not then that Paul is just some kind of a liberal thinking, oh well, we're doing something new, let's forget some of those old scriptural requirements, they're a bit out of date anyway. It's nothing whatever to do with that. 
It's a theologically worked through principle. I, through the law, died to the law. I am crucified with Christ. And the Torah itself is both fulfilled and in its very fulfillment set aside. Not because the Torah was a bad thing, a stupid first attempt by God to save people, which God then said, no, 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 that's not working, let's do it differently now. The Torah was a wonderful, glorious thing, God's holy, just, and good law, which was given for a purpose and for a time, and with the Messiah, the time is up. And all that was there in Torah that God intended to be permanent has been transformed, translated into the life of Christ and the Spirit. So when I think about Paul's worldview and I ask myself, what are the symbols of Paul's worldview? Well, they are the symbols which speak of Jesus Christ. They are, of course, the acted symbols, the praxis of baptism, of the Lord's Supper, and so on. But I've come to the conclusion that the main symbol of Paul's worldview is the united community, Jew plus Greek, slave plus free, male plus female, in Christ. The one people of Abraham for the world. When you do Pauline theology, if you look at the textbooks that crowd the shelves, you may find a chapter on the church somewhere towards the back when the writer has exhausted the topics of God, humankind, sin, salvation, Jesus Christ, his death, resurrection, the Holy Spirit. Finally, there'll be a chapter somewhere, if you're lucky, on the church. And maybe somewhere about section five or six of that chapter, there may be something on the unity of the church. I think that is just the projection onto Paul of certain types of Western Protestant thinking. And I really do think that when we read Paul in his own terms, we find that the community of Christ, in Christ, by the Spirit, the one community is absolutely central. I love the doctrine of justification, but it only occurs basically in Romans and Galatians and little flickers elsewhere. But the unity of the church is almost everywhere. We've seen him do it close up and personal in Philemon, but if you look at Galatians 2 and 3 and 4, he's arguing for the unity of the church. Galatians 2, the first great statement of justification, is all about the fact that in Christ, Jews and Gentiles sit at the same table together. That's not an incidental. That's the thing he's arguing. And if you look at 1 Corinthians again and again, is Christ divided? perish the thought. You are all one. And he builds up using this argument, that argument, treating this topic, that topic, but arriving in chapter 12 with this vision of the body of Christ, the one body, many members. And then in case you wondered how that could happen, in chapter 13, writing that majestic poem on agape, love. And then, of course, exploring what that's going to look like when you're worshipping. And the danger is that you'll collapse into chaos. But no, God is not the God of chaos, but the God of order. And then all of this rooted in the gospel which speaks of the new creation of the kingdom of God in and through Jesus' resurrection. And then when you get, say, the letter to, to, to the Philippians... How are you going to fulfill the command to let your public life as the people of God be worthy of the gospel of Christ? As he says in chapter 1, answer, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there is any affection, if there is any sharing in the Spirit, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. Have you ever tried that in a group of three or four? Have you ever tried it in a group of 10 or 20 or 50 or 90? Have you ever tried it in a room this full? It is very, very, very difficult. Don't imagine it was any easier in the first century. But don't imagine that just because we find it hard, and they found it hard, we can go soft on that commandment. Rather have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard his equality with God as something to exploit, but emptied himself, took the form of a servant. You know how it goes went all the way, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. He has done what only the one who bears the name above all names can do. And it is because of him and in him that then Paul goes on to say, do all things without grumbling and questioning so that you may be children of God without blemish in a dark world among whom you shine like lights. The unity of the church as the sign to the world that there is a different way of being human. 
or consider the letter to the Ephesians, which I preached about uh, yesterday here in chapel. Um, the unity of Jew and Gentile in Christ, chapter 2, verses 11 to 21, is the direct outflowing of that exposition of justification in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And the direct result of that in chapter 3 is precisely that through the church, this extraordinary, multicolored, many splendid, many ethnic, many language people, that through the one family we call the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. It is the fact of a new family that tells Caesar that he doesn't run the world and that Jesus Christ does instead. And as long as we continue to collude with stuff which no Paulinist ought ever to collude with, i.e. fragmentation, fissiparousness, disunity, and who cares because we're right and they're wrong, and all of that. As long as we go that route, the powers can fold their arms and watch us having our little fun because they're still running the show. But when there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, then something new has happened and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's Ephesians 4. And it's a cost. The cost of being different, Ephesians 5. The cost of sustaining the male plus female thing we call the mystery of marriage in a world that is struggling always to tear us apart. It was in the ancient world, it is in the modern world. The marriage which symbolizes again the coming together of Jew and Gentile, which symbolizes again, chapter 1, verse 10, the coming together of heaven and earth. And then in Romans itself, beloved Romans, chapters 14 and 15. You know, I've lectured on Romans, and I know perfectly well what happens, and many of you have given courses on Romans and preached on Romans, and you have your schedule, your schedule, I'm in America now, let's get this right. Um, you, you, you know how you want it to go, and you've timed it accurately, and then somehow the exposition of the first eight chapters eats up the time you'd allotted to chapters 9 to 11, and somehow you then have hardly any time for 9 to 11, and you get to 12 to 16, and it's nearly time to quit. Been there, done that. But actually, 14 and 15, are about the hard-won, complex unity of the church, which results with the church with one heart and voice glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the climax of that comes in verses 12 and 13, which is really the, 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 the summation of the whole theological argument of the letter. The root of Jesse rises to rule the nations and in him the nation. This is a letter to Rome. This is a letter to the city which rules the nations. No, the root of Jesse rises. The resurrection says Jesus Christ rules the nations, and in him the nations will hope. That's Paul's ecclesiology. And it's a new temple ecclesiology. It's about you are the temple of the living God, both corporately and individually. And that comes through in Ephesians 2. And that comes through in Romans 8, though it's normally missed there, where Paul talks about the indwelling of the Spirit. And it's the same indwelling idea where the Spirit uh, is indwelling this temple like the Shekinah, the tabernacling presence of God. And in Colossians 1, when Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, I don't think he primarily means Christ in you, well, he certainly doesn't mean in you as individuals, it's plural and human. But I also think it's not just about my hope of glory and your hope of glory. I think the picture is this. God intends to flood the whole cosmos with his glory. There is coming a time when the most spirit-filled person in this room will be just a pale shadow of what God is going to do for the entire created order. That's what Romans 8 is all about. But that is anticipated when half a dozen people in Colossae and 15 people in Philippi and a few dozen maybe in Corinth are meeting in the power of the Spirit. Christ in you, you the temple of the living God, the sign of the hope of a world that will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. We are therefore the people of the renewed covenant. I could talk about this all night and I won't. The line that runs from Jeremiah 
and Deuteronomy through into the New Testament, which speaks in Deuteronomy particularly of a covenant which has a forward look. It's not just, here you are, Israel, steady state, do this, this, and this, and then you'll be all right, and watch out if you do that and that and that. Uh, it's not quite like that. It's more, you are a people whose story is going somewhere. The worrying thing is, where is it going? And if you misbehave and if you break the covenant, then ultimately you will go into exile. Read Deuteronomy 27, 28, and 29. But then when you're in exile, if you return to the Lord with all your heart and soul, he will circumcise your heart so that you'll be able to love him with all your heart. And then you will hear a word saying, that the word, that you will hear the word that the word is near you on your lips and in your heart. You will say, don't say uh, who, who will go up into heaven and get it? Who will go across the sea? This covenant, this law, it's so difficult, how can we do it? No, the word will be near you on your lips and in your heart so that you may do it. And Paul picks up exactly that, not only in Romans 10 where he quotes it explicitly, but by implication in Galatians 3, in Romans 2, in Romans 7 and 8, and says again and again, you are the people of the renewed covenant. The long story of Israel has had its explosive fulfillment in Jesus Christ as Messiah. Take away the idea of Jesus as Messiah, make Jesus Messiahship simply, that's his proper name, Jesus Christ. No, not, you know, I've met some people who think it's his surname, as though his parents were called Joseph Christ and Mary Christ. You know? <laughs> um, Christos means Messiah. And the Messiah is the one who sums up Israel in himself so that what is true of him becomes true of them. And now the new covenant has been inaugurated and the people who are in Christ discover that when they confess with their lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they are in fact doing the Torah in the sense the deepest sense that God always intended. And therefore, they are also the renewed humanity through whom God will put the world to rights. We often screen out this stuff, but have you noticed that odd little bit at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 6? When Paul's saying, you shouldn't be having lawsuits among yourselves, says casually, offhand, don't you know that we will judge angels? And we want to say, uh, no, Paul, actually, we didn't know that, sorry. And, um, <laughs> Where do you get that idea from? <laughs> I think he gets it from Jewish apocalyptic, from Daniel and elsewhere, where the people of God will be exalted to be under God the rulers of the world. We talk about reigning with Christ, but I suspect it's a dead metaphor for us because we haven't thought through our eschatology. But it comes again in Romans 5, just when you expect him to say, as sin reigned in death, so grace or whatever, and he's coming to that later, he actually says, those who receive the gift of grace will reign, will reign. Basil Yusufin, that's, they will be kings. Paul lived in a world where there was a Basil a king, Caesar. No, we will be kings. What does that mean? 1 Corinthians 15, the kingdom of God which is over all the powers of the world and will defeat them. We are the human beings who are designed to play the key role in God's renewal of all things. Don't so stress the doctrine of your own salvation that you fail to see what we are saved for. And in and through all of this, we are the people of God in the Messiah we are people who have been radically redefined and transformed in our very existence, status, and everything else by his death and resurrection. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but the Messiah lives in me. And the night life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The faithfulness of the Messiah, I know this has been controversial, but let me just explain very briefly what I mean by it. In Romans 3, Paul says at the beginning of chapter 3 that it looks as though all Israel has failed. But what has Israel failed at? Just believing, just being people who God likes or wants or whatever? No, Israel was given a commission. 
Israel was given, like supposing I was to give one of you a letter and say, will you deliver this letter to the person who's out there for me? And if you were to be faithful to that commission, it would mean that you wouldn't keep the letter for yourself. You would go and take it to the person for whom it was destined. Paul says, Israel is greatly privileged. To begin with, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were not given them for themselves. They were entrusted with those oracles to take to the world. That's what the Abrahamic promise was all about. So when Paul says Israel has been faithless, he doesn't just mean they didn't have faith in some abstract sense. They have failed in that commission. And I have good Jewish friends, including some deeply orthodox Jewish friends who will admit that the Jewish people have not actually been the light of the world in the way they were called to. I don't, don't say that out of the slightest degree of anti-Judaism, far from it, rather the opposite, actually, out of grief for the plight. But then Paul's, what is God going to do faced with that? Is God going to say, as many theologians and schemes have imagined God is going to say, oh, well, that was a first attempt. Never mind. Let's forget that. Let's just do it differently. Let's send my son, Jesus. He will die for the sins of the world, and we can forget all that Israel stuff. There's a whole amount of Western theology which has implicitly said exactly that. And then, of course, they misread Romans. <laughs> Paul says instead, now God's covenant faithfulness has been unveiled through the faithfulness of the Messiah for the benefit of all who are faithful. The one doesn't cancel out the other. He is Israel in person. And we, if we have faith, that's why faith is not an arbitrary badge of the people of God. It is the Messiah badge. We are to be the faithful people in the one who was faithful. And so come full circle to Galatians 2 again. All who believe in Jesus the Messiah belong at the same table. And this, then and now, is the challenge to the powers. Leslie Newbegin said it. We heard it quoted earlier. And this is the full context of the doctrine of justification. Do it like this. God will put the world right one day. He's promised to do so. He's launched that project in Jesus Christ. He's going to do it. How? Through human beings. Creation is longing for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. Because God has subjected creation to futility, not of its own will, but of the will of him who created it. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to, get to, to, to decay, to share the liberty of the glory of the children of God. What does that mean? That when the children of God are glorified, then creation will give a huge sigh of relief and say, I'm really glad you lot have finally got your act together. Because creation is longing to be wisely stewarded by the gentle, wise governance of human beings. And therefore, God puts human beings in the right against the day when he will put the world right. Justification is not to take you out of the world. It's to qualify you to be God's putting right people for the world. That's why between present justification and future justification comes the entire theology of justice. And unless you make those connections... You're not thinking Paul's thoughts after him. But how does that happen? It happens because he sends his son as the faithful Israelite who takes the weight of the world's sin upon himself in order then, once it's been defeated and dealt with, to launch new creation. That, I think, is how it works. So the center of Paul's worldview in terms of symbolism, center is a difficult word, the center is Jesus Christ, the center is God, the center is the Holy Spirit, whatever. But in terms of worldview symbolism, the thing which is there is this community, Philemon and Onesimus getting it together, Euodia and Syntyche in Philippians getting it together, Jew and Gentile learning in Antioch or in Galatia to sit at the same table in Christ. That is the center of the united community. How can that community come into existence? How can it be if it doesn't have the symbols which mark it out as an ethnic people or whatever? The only way that that community can be generated and sustained, I believe, and I believe Paul believes, is through what we call theology. I believe when we're reading Paul, we are seeing the birth of a discipline, 
which we now call Christian theology. See, the Jews in Paul's day, if you'd ask them questions about God, about the future, about humankind, etc., they could give answers to that, but that was not their discipline. That wasn't what they habitually did, wasn't what the rabbis did. Theology, as good Jewish scholars will tell you, is basically a Christian discipline, not a Jewish discipline, because the theology plays a role within Paul's worldview, a role, the key role. Theology has to grow to be a new task, the prayerful reflection on and invocation of the one true God. That's why in Romans 12, Paul summoning people to obedient worship says you have to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's not enough to coast along, following a few rules, doing a few odd things here and there, hoping it'll all work out. Christians have always been in the forefront in world history of education. There's a reason for that. Christians have always wanted to teach people to read. There's a reason for that. Christians have always wanted to love God with their mind as well as their heart and soul and strength. There's a reason for that. God wants us to be in Christ, people who can think through who this God is, because unless every generation is doing that, the church will divide, the church will go squadgy in the middle, and the principalities and powers will say, oh good, we were worried for a moment, but now they've done what they usually did, and we will go on running the world the way we want. Because who is this God of whom Paul speaks? He is the one God of Abraham. Jewish monotheism is absolutely basic for Paul, but it's a monotheism that has been radically redefined around the Messiah and the Spirit. I've expounded this in many places, and so have many other people, including some sitting in this room, so this may not come as a surprise, but Paul in several passages takes uh, the, the, the Jewish statements of monotheism themselves and discovers Jesus in the middle of them. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 is the best known example, perhaps, when Paul says, for us there is one God the Father from whom are all things, and we to him, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things, and we through him. We think, well, that's a bit of a mouthful. Well, it is. Because what he's done is taken the Jewish prayer, the daily prayer, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Lord, God, Lord, one. And he's rephrased that prayer so that by God we mean the Father, and by Lord, Kyrios, Yahweh, we mean Jesus the Messiah. That is the most breathtaking piece of theology. You know, when I was younger, it used to be said that, oh, well, uh, Jewish monotheism was so strong that there wasn't a theology of incarnation until much later when the world moved away, when the church moved away from its early Jewish roots. Absolute rubbish. Here is early Christology. It's already instantiated by the early 50s there and possibly even earlier. That right at the heart of Jewish monotheism is Jesus himself and then the Holy Spirit as well. In 1 Corinthians 12, just at the point where Paul is saying that the body of Christ is one and must be one and must live as one, he says it three different ways. There are varieties of gifts but the same spirit. There are varieties of workings but the same Lord. There are varieties of of, of ministries but it is the same God who is at work. It's all one but it's spirit, Lord and God. Same in Galatians 4, when he says uh, that God, when the fullness of time came, sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, and then because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then he says, now that you know God. How do you know God? You know God as the God of the Exodus, that's all there in that passage, but the God who sent the son and the God who sends the spirit of the son. If the doctrine of the Trinity hadn't existed, it would be necessary on the basis of these passages to invent it. And the result of having this God as our God is renewed humanness. We are made in the image of God, and one of the basic spiritual laws is that you become like what you worship. Dangerous, isn't it? We all worship. You've got to serve somebody. Obligatory quote from the great Bob Dylan. 
when you worship this God, a genuine humanness results. A humanness which knows about resources and what to do with them. A humanness which knows about responsibilities and how to exercise them. A humanness which knows about relationships and how difficult they are, but how in Christ they can be healed. A humanness, in other words, which isn't going to diminish resources, responsibilities, and relationships into money, sex, and power. We talk about money, sex, and power because we live in a shrunken world and we are called by worshipping this God to grow up into the three R's. And all this over against Caesar's world, where there are many gods, many lords, but you better watch out because Caesar's a pretty powerful one among them, and where money, sex, and power are rampant. Paul's call to monotheism, Christologically reshaped monotheism, pneumatologically re-energized monotheism. And then, secondly, the doctrine of election. Monotheism, election, and eschatology. These are the three great Jewish doctrines. If you force Jews to do theology, those are the three things they're going to come up with. Election. Who are the people of God? I've already spoken quite a bit about that. They are Israel. They are the circumcision. They are the family of Abraham. They are the seed of Abraham. They are now focused in and on the Messiah. And again, the Jewish doctrine of election is reworked in and through the death and resurrection of the Messiah and then put into operation afresh by the Spirit. This is New Covenant theology. It's difficult to state because these days, if you get anywhere near what I've just said, somebody will use the blessed S word, supersession, and say, oh, this tells you that the church has superseded Israel. No, Israel, Israel is the people of the Messiah according to the flesh. This is where we need Romans 9 to 11, and I'm going to impose a self-denying ordinance and not even begin to do the exegesis of Romans 9 to 11, except to say this. In Romans 9, 6 to 10, 13, Paul tells the covenant story of Israel from Abraham through to the return from exile, from Abraham through to that which Deuteronomy 30 promised. He tells this story, a 2,000-year story of the people of God, this great, amazing history, all going to the point where, in chapter 10, verse 4, the king the anointed one, the Messiah has come. He is the goal. He is the telos. He is the climax of the whole thing. And as a result, in him, we have this great new blessing. And Paul tells this story in a letter to Rome. Rome, where precisely at this time, a thousand-year history, well, 700-odd year history, was being told in a new way. To say that from the very beginning with Romulus and Remus, there was this great purpose which was moving forwards. We've actually had the Aeneid mentioned a couple of times in this conference so far. And through that great purpose, it was a republic for most of that time. But then, in fact, there was a hidden purpose which is now at last revealed. And in the empire of Augustus Caesar and then his successors, the one who is called Son of God and Savior, the one who has brought justice and peace to the world, dikaiosune and irene in Greek, the very words which Paul uses so much in Romans. Through this man, a new age has dawned, an age which we announce with the word euvangelion, gospel. Paul knows what he's doing. Just as monotheism confronts the idols of the world, when redefined in Jesus Christ and by the Spirit, so does election. Perhaps it is because our world is afraid of that challenge, that when you get anywhere near, it shouts, oh, supersession, can't do that. Caesar is quite happy at that move. 
Because especially as in Ephesians 3, the task of the church just to be itself in Christ is the standing rebuke to the powers, as I said before. We are to be the people of reconciliation, the people of responsibility, the people who look at the powers of the world and hold them to account. Not because we're anarchists, not because we're um, just a Christian version of 18th century left-wing political philosophy. Far from it. God wants the world to be ordered. Colossians 1 all the powers and principalities created in and through and for Christ. God is the God of order, not of chaos. This is the foundation of Christian political theology. But as soon as you give anyone any responsibility anywhere, heaven help us, especially it seems sometimes in the church, you give them the temptation to abuse that for their own prestige and power and privilege and all the rest of it. Money, sex, and power again. And when that happens, they need to be dethroned. Not so that then there can be a holy or indeed an unholy anarchy, but so that there then can be wise order and rule again. We go around this cycle again and again. Politics is the constant toing and froing between tyranny and chaos. But we believe in Jesus Christ and in the sovereign saving rule that he exercises from the cross and in his resurrection. And we have the task of modeling before the world what that sort of polis would look like. Not as an independent thing, hiding away from the world, keeping the light to ourselves, so that we can then say, look at the rest of the world, isn't it dark? Well, of course it is if you're not shining the light there. Paul says you've got to shine the light into the world and you have to hold the powers to account by what you are and then and then only by what you say. And that is the context for the apostolic task of mission. And then thirdly, after monotheism and election, there is, of course, eschatology, the great Jewish hope, which I've already mentioned, that one day God would flood the world with his glory and love and knowledge as the waters cover the sea, so that the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the calf and the cow and the bear will feed, and a little child will lead them. Because the earth will be full of va'ath adhanai, knowing Yahweh. There will be a deep knowing of the Creator from every blade of grass and every whale and every waterfall. That's the Jewish hope. And to serve that Jewish hope, there is the hope of the land. There is the hope that the land will be fulfilled and prosperous and that the land will turn out to have been an advanced metaphor for the whole world. There is the hope of the rebuilding of the temple, but actually the hope that one day God will do to the whole world what he's going to do so that the whole world will become a temple. The temple is already a cosmic image. And this will involve the rescue of Israel from her enemies. It will involve the defeat of tyranny and evil in every shape and form, and ultimately of death itself. And the defeat of death, of course, means resurrection. And it will involve, above all, the return of Yahweh to Zion so that his glory may dwell in the world forever. And Paul sees every single bit of that Jewish hope fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah and implemented by the Spirit. You can chase through passage after passage where this comes. And again, he articulates this in the face of the rather hopeless philosophies of his day, Stoicism believed that the world did have a narrative, but everything would go on and on, and then one day it would all collapse into fire, and then Phoenix-like it would be reborn, and the whole stuff would happen again. The Epicureans just believe in random process. They are the Darwinians of the first century, if you like, and that the the world consists of molecules which are just doing their own thing and following their own course, and if there is a God, he's so far away that he doesn't bother. Not much hope there unless you happen to be lucky enough to own land and have money and slaves and be able to do stuff. But particularly this eschatology is to be articulated in the face of Caesar and his imperial hope. And when Paul uses the word parousia, second coming or appearing, parousia is not an Old Testament technical term, it is a Caesar technical term. It's what happens when Caesar has been away from Rome on a journey or fighting a battle, and he comes back, his royal appearing, his royal and perhaps divine appearing, because by this time, some of the Caesars at least started to give themselves divine honors. And everyone goes out to meet him, to welcome him back into the city. That's the parousia. That's what's going on in 1 Thessalonians 4. Jesus is coming back 
and it is at his name that every knee will bow. Philippians 3, where Paul has been saying, I want you to imitate me. And well, he's just been talking about how he gives up his privileges as a, as a Jew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews and all the rest of it. How can the Philippians give up their privileges? Well, they're not Jews, most of them. But they are, some of them at least, citizens of the Roman Empire. And they all benefit from Rome. He says, I want you to sit light to that. I want you to sit loose to it. Because their God is the belly. They glory in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And let me tell you, we didn't discuss this this afternoon, though we might have done. When Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, he does not mean, therefore, one day we'll be going there. Because the, how, the, how the whole logic of citizenship works. Rome had founded colonies around the Greek world, some way to the east of them because they'd fought all kinds of civil wars a century before the time of Paul, and there were all these old soldiers out there, and the last thing Rome wanted was those old soldiers coming back to Italy, or let alone to Rome. Old soldiers coming back with too much uh, uh, loot and booty on their hands but nowhere to live are a real pain for a small city that's already overcrowded like Rome. So you found colonies who are citizens of Rome, but colonizing Greece, or wherever they are, with Roman culture. When Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, he doesn't mean, so when we retire, we'll go back there. He means you are the people who are bringing the civilization of heaven into the world in which you are placed. And it is from heaven that we expect the Savior, the Lord, the King, Jesus. Those are all Caesar words. Who will change the body of our humiliation to be like the body of his glory by the power which enables him to subject all things to himself. Paul as often quotes Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you take thought for him? You have made him little lower than the angels and crown him with glory and honor, putting all things in subjection under his feet. Paul would have said that is the Adam picture and it is also the Jesus picture. And it is the picture because of which we know that Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. And within that eschatology, as in Romans 8, prayer is that bit of anticipated eschatology, which we do even though we don't understand it, but which holds heaven and earth together like this with the struggle and the groaning of creation so that when we pray at the places where the world is in pain, we sense its pain in ourselves. And then if we have faith, we sense the spirit groaning within us. Where is God in all of this? God is not outside the pain, outside the mess. God is there at the heart of the mess. That's why Paul says, we are chosen that we might be conformed to the image of his son. Back to the letter to Philemon again, or to 2 Corinthians 5. Prayer stands cruciform at the place where the world is in pain to hold together Jew and Greek and slave and free, to hold together male and female, to hold together a battered and bleeding world and say, no, there is a different way to be human. Think of Desmond Tutu in South Africa, truth and reconciliation. And, 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 and Desmond has suffered enormously as a result of that work. That is gospel work. We need theology, not because it's a nice thing to get our ideas sorted out and our heads organized so that we can do the jigsaw of all these wonderful abstract ideas, but because without prayerful, reflective investigation of who God is, who the people of God are, and what the one hope that belongs to our call is, without that prayerful, wise investigation, the worldview which we call the one church in Jesus Christ will not be able to sustain itself. If you don't believe me, think of churches where they've given up on theology, and you'll see what I mean. So Romans 15 sums it all up, as I said before. The aim is that you may with one heart and voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I come back to it again, that wonderful passage where he quotes from the great eschatological scene in Isaiah 11. The messianic passage, the passage which speaks of the root of David, 
the one who is coming and because of whom the wolf will lie down with the lamb, etc. Therefore, welcome one another, he says in verse 7, as the Messiah welcomed you to the glory of God. Because I tell you, this is actually the summary of Paul's gospel. You want a quick summary of Paul's gospel? Romans 15, uh, 8 will pretty well do, 8 and 9 will pretty well do it. The Messiah became a servant to the circumcised because of the truthfulness of God to confirm the promises to the patriarchs and that the Gentiles would glorify God for his mercy. There you've got it. Not a lot missed out there, really. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the nations and sing praises to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise him, all you Gentiles. Praise the Lord. Let all the peoples praise him. And then Isaiah says, and if you've ever written anything careful and structured, you know that your two best points are the ones you put at the very beginning and at the very end. It can go a bit funny in the middle, but as long as you've got that structure, um, <laughs> this is not advice as to how to write term papers, though maybe it would work like that. But what does Paul say at the beginning of his letter? He says, I am a servant of the gospel of the Son of God who was descended from the seed of David according to the flesh and designated Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus the Messiah our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you lot in Rome, who have a different Son of God living up the street who have somebody who thinks he is all-powerful, who demands your complete allegiance. No, it's Jesus who does that. And then right round from Romans 1, 3 and 4 to Romans 15, 12 and following, here we have the root of Jesse rises to rule the nations, and in him the nations will hope. You bet we will. But I don't want to end at that point. I want to end with the longest short journey in the world. Again, come back where we started. The journey home for a runaway slave. Because as far as Paul's concerned, all that theology has to be focused now on this question in this church, now on these two people who are having difficulty, now on this crisis where the Jews and Gentiles are separating at the table, and now perhaps on the great political questions and how is the church gonna navigate its way through when you're working at the Philemon-type tasks, and most of us probably spend most of our life actually working at those tasks rather than the big grandiose things that would be such fun, we are to be people who put into effect the exodus which Jesus Christ has achieved through his death. We are to be people who stand there between the Philemons and Onesimuses of the world and say, in Christ you are reconciled, and here's how it might work out. This life, this community, here, now, that's where it matters. God give us grace. So to study Paul prayerfully, wisely, that that worldview symbol of the United Church will say to the principalities and powers of the next generation that Jesus is Lord and that they are not. May we pause and pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for the astonishing vision of Paul, for the way you equipped him, strengthened him for his task, and gave him the energy and vision to put it into practice even at huge cost to himself. Gracious Lord, raise up, we pray, in this generation young women and men who will be fired by that same zeal for Jesus, for his death and resurrection, who in the power of the Spirit will work for the unity of the church and for its witness in a dangerous and divided world. O oh, gracious Lord, do it, we pray, in the power of the Spirit, because we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus our Lord. Amen. We have some time for questions, and uh, I'll, I'll ask them. You, you ask them, but uh, yeah, fine. Works better that way, Tom. 
We've got a whole range of questions. We can't possibly address them all, as you would imagine, but a few. People are very curious about this book on Paul you're working on, the size, scope, goal of it, maybe even the price it'll cost. Uh, could you describe that? And of course, when will it be out? You have people here wanting to read it. Yeah, I want to read it. I want to read it too. Um, it, it, it is, there's a lot of it written and there's a lot of it yet to write. It, it, it has been a very exciting task. I actually just summarized it in the last hour, so you probably you know, get the idea, I hope. But there is an enormous amount of stuff which I need to do in detail because pretty well every line I said just now is hugely controversial in some quarters at least. And uh, though it's impossible to annotate as fully as one might like because it would be a whole shelf of books if one did, I, I want to try to pick the right arguments to work through in more detail. So there is quite a long way to go yet. And it will be many, many months before um, the task is done because I do have a rather complicated day job. And uh, the result of that is that I doubt if it will be out within the next 18 months. Um, it may well be 2012. Um, I would be very grateful if you would just from time to time pray about that because um, it is quite a challenge. But I'm determined to finish it before I keel over. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about unity and this theme of the unity of the church that you have emphasized. A couple of different questions. Um, several times in several different forms, questions have come from pastors or seminarians or even the people involved in lay leadership of congregations, and in various ways what they're really asking for is, given the importance of the unity of the church for the meaning of the gospel, what practical steps would you recommend at the congregational level of everyday life to affect more of that unity? Great question. There are lots of things we, well, some things we can't easily do together. Many churches do not allow their members or encourage their clergy uh, to celebrate the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, together. There are some which expressly forbid it. No churches, so far as I know, forbid their members to read the Bible with Christians of other denominations. No churches, so far as I know, forbid people to meet together and pray. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be doing that. And we need to do it across traditions. Sometimes it'll be difficult, but those are difficulties we should face rather than shirk. No churches, so far as I know, forbid their members to organize local soup kitchens together, to do kingdom building projects together in their local community. And in fact, many healthy churches that I know are churches where people are doing that sort of thing together, despite the fact that it's difficult to do the central act of worship together. Some churches I know do baptism preparations ecumenically. Okay, you want to be baptized, right, well, it's probably gonna be this church where that's gonna happen, but we've actually got a team of local lay people here and they are laying on courses of parents, of children who want to, be baptized, want to have them baptized or for adults who to be baptized or whatever. Why shouldn't we do that ecumenically? If it raises difficulties, let's address those difficulties. Nothing's stopping us doing that. There are plenty of resources. So those are, those are I mean, I see this happening in my own diocese, thank God. Um, and, and one of the encouraging things to me was when I was at the Synod of Bishops in Rome 18 months ago, to hear one Roman Catholic bishop after another saying, we must have the Bible in our own language. Everybody must have it in their own language. Every man, woman, and child, they were saying, from the Catholic point of view, must have the Bible in their own native tongue and must be taught how to read it. And then they were saying, the Bible is one of the great ecumenical tools. And I came back home and said to my colleagues, this is what the Roman Catholic bishops are saying. They want to read the Bible with other Christians. So that's what we've been doing in the north of England this last Lent. It's wonderful. People are discovering it's not difficult. It, it has all sorts of interesting ramifications, but in, in principle, it's a wonderful thing. So there's some places to start anyway. Thank you very much. Another question at a practical level of life on the ground. A lot of the folks at this conference the last few days have been theology lovers. That's probably why they've come out. And you just talked very eloquently in the last few minutes about the value and importance of theology for the life of the church. What encouragement or advice would you give to pastors or lay leaders heading back to congregations that, to use your phrase, have given up on theology or who perhaps have an anti-intellectual streak? Anti-intellectualism is a real problem in my culture as well as yours. Um, it is kind of assumed that books over a certain number of pages are just you know, beyond uh, consideration, and this is, of course, people like me suffer terribly as a result of that. Um, 
Um, but we, we, we have a sort of quick fix mentality. If I can't get it sussed this weekend, it's, I'm, I'm not going to bother. You know? And we need to inculcate that desire. I found in my diocese again, which is what I can speak from experience in, we have courses called Living Theology Today for, quote, ordinary, unquote, lay people. And clergy encourage uh, lay members of their churches to go on this. And often the lay members are deeply reluctant to begin with and think, oh, well, I'll try it for a week or two, but obviously I'm not going to keep it up. And then to their surprise, because these courses are well designed to woo them in, they discover that it's actually rather exciting to think about who God is, to think about what it all means, how it works, all this stuff that they hear in the prayers and the liturgy and in, in the scripture readings and, and, and so on. And again and again, I meet those people at the end of that year's course. They come to my house and we have a ceremony and I give them little certificates and they say I, I never thought it was going to be this fun this much fun but now that I've started I'm certainly not going to stop and one person who um, had no particular university education or anything like that um, said to me I, I have a sense I'm never going to be bored again as long as I live he said I've got this whole world opened up in front of me and I just can't wait to get more of it that's the testimony of ordinary little educated people in working class northern England if we can do it so can you your address quoted, and you mentioned briefly uh, Ephesians chapter 4, one body and one spirit, just as you're called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Last year at this theology conference, Gordon Fee, another Pauline uh, specialist uh, like yourself, commented on the neglect of the Holy Spirit in those who work on Paul's theology, yet the one body and one spirit is cited in 4.4 of Ephesians. Could you comment a little more and flesh out a little more the connection between spirit and body in the unity of the church? Wow, yeah. That's probably a chapter of a book or something, but... Uh, probably is. Well, in, in Gordon Fee's case, it's one of his very large and excellent books. Um, the, 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 yeah. Uh, God's, God's power at work, um, God's personal power at work, um, the thing about the Spirit is that the Spirit doesn't draw attention to the Spirit. The Spirit draws attention to Jesus Christ, and the Spirit enables people to be the people of Christ for the world. And uh, if you look round, as it were, to, to, to catch a glimpse of the Spirit at work, you may be asking the wrong question. You ought to be asking, who is the next neighbor I ought to be loving? Or which is the next bit of justice and mercy I ought to be helping with? And you ought then to pray for the Spirit and then get on and do it and trust that the Spirit is at work. Um, otherwise, if you're always turning around to, to look and see if it's happening, um, it's like if I try and turn around and look at the picture of myself here, all I see is the back of my own head, um, <laughs> which is... Um, <laughs> Um, so, I, I, so it's, it's a strange thing. The charismatic movement, I think, has caused a lot of us to lighten up and enjoy the fact that we can celebrate and invoke the Spirit. But the Spirit blows where he wants, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's coming from and where it's going to. That's, that's how it often is. And uh, so it seems to me we need to say, OK, here's the goal. We need to be united. What's the means? The Holy Spirit. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit. Veni creator spiritus. Let's pray that prayer and let's then go to the work of unity. And don't imagine we're going to have one global united church tomorrow. And you might, some of you might be very suspicious if you thought there was going to be such a thing. But that shouldn't make us collude with the vociferousness of Western, particularly postmodern culture. You know, postmodernity is where we are. It was a necessary protest movement against the arrogance of modernity, but it's not a great place to stay forever. We've got to come through and out the other side. Let's try to pull together a couple of things we're talking about. One is the importance of theology for the church. The other is the paramount importance of unity for the church. But sometimes we see those two things in collision. Could you talk a little bit about grounds, if any, that you would see that would justify schism? Um, n n nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> Say it how you wish. Nothing it's justifies. Not squadgy, I know that. <laughs> how do you spell squadgy, by the way? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I got a lot of questions. N nothing justifies schism. Schism is what happens when some bits of the church decide to do their own thing and to ignore the rest of the body of Christ. 
The problem comes, of course, when the people who are doing that are actually running an entire denomination or part thereof. And then others discern that it is those people who have done that who are the schismatics, but as happened in the third, fourth, fifth century, Donatists and so on, um, both sides often call the other one schismatic. And, and, and then there is a real difficulty of discernment. And because we are all sinful, frequently the issues are not clear cut. But in 1 Corinthians, we have some pretty clear statements about two things. There are some things which we have to learn to agree to differ on, and other things which we cannot agree to differ on. And we need to know how to distinguish which is which. Corinthians navigates and negotiates between the two. You cannot, you know, the Sabbath, circumcision, food laws, these are now, the technical term is adiaphora. They are things which don't make a difference. Some Christians keep the food laws in Paul's world, others don't. And Paul says, doesn't matter. You are brothers and sisters in Christ. But when in 1 Corinthians 5, it turns out that there's somebody who's been sleeping with his stepmother, sleeping with his father's wife, Paul doesn't say, well, that's fine. Some of us think incest is okay and others of us think it's not. So let not the one who does judge the one who doesn't. No, he doesn't. He says, kick him out. How do you tell the difference between the differences that make a difference and the differences that don't make a difference? One of the great challenges of any day, it's come home to roost for us in this generation, but actually it's a perennial challenge for the church. And uh, 1 Corinthians is a great place to start to begin to address that. Thank you. A couple of other questions. The motto of Wheaton College is for Christ and his kingdom. People often associate the kingdom of God with the teaching of Jesus, but not so much with the teaching of Paul. Do you see those two as on the same page or different themes headed in different directions? They are very much on the same page, but uh, when you think of Jesus and Paul, um, often this is one of the things that people pull out and say, well, there it is. Um, Jesus preached about the kingdom of God. Paul preached about Jesus. So clearly he was falsifying uh, the, the, the message of Jesus. Not so. Because of the achievement of Jesus, Paul can speak of the kingdom of Jesus and of God through him. Paul sometimes distinguishes, as in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28, between the kingdom of Christ, which is already a reality. Jesus is already running this world. The whole policy of the Enlightenment was not only to deny that, but to make it seem ridiculous. We are here in the power of the Spirit to show what it means in practice and to do the things which mean that it looks credible after all to think that Jesus is running the show. I see things like that going on in some of the parishes that I work with. It's wonderful when you go and see what they're doing and say, this wouldn't be happening unless Jesus was in charge. That's part of the aim of what church is to be, to be the sort of community that make people say that. But then Paul then uses the phrase kingdom of God in a rather specialized sense to mean the final kingdom, the time when God will be all in all. That ain't happened yet. Death and sin are still rampant. I don't need to tell you that. But Jesus is Lord and his lordship is defined not least through Psalm 8 and Psalm 110, which speak of him as the one to whom every knee shall bow. That's Isaiah 45 thrown in for good measure. And speak of him also as the one who will defeat all the enemies of God and of God's people. In other words, of creation, sin and death, the things which corrupt and destroy and deface God's good world. So Paul's theology of the kingdom is, as it were, at the next stage in the story from Jesus, because Jesus is saying, it's coming, it's breaking in, it's here. The stuff that I'm doing, that's, that is kingdom stuff. But he then has to die on the cross, as we were thinking last night, as part of that, because only his death on the cross actually defeats death and hence all the other enemies of God. But now with the resurrection, we're in phase two. That's why there's a slightly different tone of voice. It isn't just the identical same meaning. It's at a different point in the narrative, but it's the same reality. In light of all of that, a number of people have been curious about how you understand your own role as a bishop and in the House of Lords speaking into social and political issues, public policy issues, in light of that sort of kingdom theology. How, how can you not? How can you not? Uh, I, I just think I happen to have been given a microphone in a public place for a very, very short time. 
Uh, no one is a bishop in England for very long. You know, it's sort of seven years or ten years, or some manage to hang on a bit longer. But, but for, and for that very short time, while you can say something, then, for goodness sake, say it. And I've had the privilege of speaking on a number of issues in the Lords. And sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. Sometimes all you can do is put down, that's how political life works. You can't win, you can't succeed all the time. Occasionally, if people are praying and if people are working, and all the, particularly the prayer, then sometimes extraordinary things happen and you suddenly discover we actually won that one. But sometimes the best you can do, and that's okay too, is to put down a marker, to get something on public record, to let people know that there's a lot of us out there that are not going to sit by and watch global debt just go on and on and on, that we're not going to sit by and watch our Home Office thugs bullying asylum seekers and bundling them onto planes and sending them back to countries where they'll be tortured, and that we're not going to sit by while the very rich do for the very rich, as Brown and Sylvia pointed out, what they refuse to do for the very poor, and so on. And I just think, OK, I've got to do it. Let's Let's go for it. And uh, when I stop doing it, I hope and pray others will come and, and do it after me. But uh, it, that's a very specialised sense. It's very odd in terms of world history to have bishops being members of a House of Parliament. It seems to me it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, the people who want to ba banish bishops from the House of Lords are, are not mostly Anabaptist-type Christians. There may be one or two of those. They're the secularists who want the rumour of God pushed off the public square. And as long as I'm in this job, I'm jolly well going to make sure it stays there. And I counsel the rest of you to try and do it as much as you can. A couple of more questions, if you have the stamina. You're a very patient man. Well, <laughs> two questions. <laughs> do you want me to ask two more questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. See, I'm working them against you. I'm sorry. Um, if faith is a sign of the covenant membership, how do people get into the covenant? Grace. Grace. So yes or no answers might even work here. If Paul had had a son, would he have had him circumcised? That's a great question. Great question. Um, Depends on the mother was. <laughs> Grant says it depends who the mother was. Um, <laughs> um, that's cognate with the question which people do ask, which is, um, did Paul continue to keep the kosher laws? And I, there are some scholars here in this room who would say yes and some who would say no. Um, it's not exactly clear. Paul is abundantly clear that you do not have to be circumcised to belong to the people of God. Paul equally was prepared, as with Timothy in Acts, that if the missionary demands of the church involve going in as a bona fide member into the synagogue, then if that Jewish person who's going to do that needs to get circumcised, then they need to get circumcised. But you can see Paul negotiating this one through Galatians, through Acts, through Romans, and I don't know, it depends entirely what Paul thought the missionary demands were at that point. This is where 1 Corinthians 9 is so important. I become all things to all people so that I might by all means save some. You go that route and some of your friends will always call you inconsistent. It's your call in, in Christ and by the Spirit how you discern when to become a Jew to the Jews to win Jews, when to become outside the law to those outside the law in order to win those outside the law. But that's, I think, the way Paul would have framed the issue. Last question. We appreciate your patience. It's great. This is the third of the last two questions. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yes. The grace one was too easy. Okay. The grace, yeah, the grace one, that was fast. Uh, how would you distinguish your understanding of justification from the Roman Catholic position? Uh, part of the question is which Roman Catholic? Now, uh, because th there's, uh, I mean, seriously, there are, there, are, uh, there are the official dogmas, and there is the Council of Trent, and there are the expositions of the Council of Trent, and there are probably Roman Catholics in this room who know that tradition much better than I do. When I was um, in Oxford 20 years ago, 
uh, and the new Anglican Roman Catholic Agreement on Salvation and the Church was published, a number of us were asked if we would go and speak to joint meetings of Anglicans and Roman Catholics about justification and salvation. And the first one I did, my opposite number, and we went in the car together, was Father Ted Yarnold, famous Jesuit of blessed memory now, great theologian. And I don't know if we tossed a coin before we started, but anyway, he spoke first. And he began by saying very simply, I just want to remind you what the doctrine of justification is. It's basically that we are all sinners. There's absolutely nothing we can do to earn God's favor. So it all has to be of grace. And the only response that we can possibly make is not one which carries any merit, it's simply faith. And I thought, well, we can all go home then. Um, <laughs> no. Here is one of the great Roman Catholic teachers of the 70s and 80s in England um, saying pretty much in kind of easy layman's language um, what I had understood to be the Protestant doctrine of justification. And actually, I think now, however the formulations go in our different churches, there is a wonderful openness not only in Rome but in the Orthodox and all across the board to being able to explore some of these things differently. Just as, please God, there is a wonderful openness among many Protestants to reread Romans, to reread Galatians, to be more faithful to what Paul is saying, not less, not to the detriment of our traditions, whatever they may be, because they were inspired by the Spirit as far as any traditions are inspired by the Spirit. I do not believe that any traditions are infallible. I believe they all need to be re-reformed in the light of Scripture. That includes my own traditions, and that it seems to me we all have the task, whether Roman, Protestant, whatever, to be prepared to say, OK, let's go back, read this together, and I think there are all sorts of possibilities for ecumenical advancement. Tom, thank you. Thank you.